welcome to the Victoria Rumble Room, a show that always endeavors to bring you important stories, at least we think they're important, from Victoria, BC, Canada, the wide, wonderful world. I'm Robin Adair, and across town, and what I like to think of as his pleasure dome is the Croatian sensation himself, John Jurisic. And John, again, there's so much going on right now, including the weather. We're having some decent weather here now, but man, there's places in the world where it is so hot. I bet you they wish right now they could trade and have a little bit more of our cool, temperate weather. For the time being, Robin, I mean, last year, we had our heat dome. Yeah. Why were you know, not participating in, in, this, in this heat wave across the world, I don't know. But this is a big problem. And, and, and you know, particularly frustrating because we can't do anything about it. We can just react to it. I, I, it doesn't feel like anyone really taking, honestly, honestly, for all those climate change activists out there, it just doesn't feel for the normal person that we're able to do anything, that anything's really being done about this. Hey, I'm riding my electric bike. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, but listen, you know, the sun is allowing us to have uh, some fun. Look, I'm wearing my, my summer garb. It's allowing us to have an excuse to poke and have some fun at the prime minister's expense, right? Well, and there's a theme of sunshine around this particular bit we're about to run. Uh, no secret that uh, Justin Trudeau has been out on the West Coast quite a bit recently. And we're about to feature somebody who is not, in fact, the prime minister, but sure sounds like him. And, uh, well, let's, let's take a look to see how he's managed to wrap a little humor around Justin Trudeau. Today represents a troubling and sad moment in Canadian history. The volleyball team next to me uh, declined my request to uh, participate in a game. We think of Canadians as being uh, respectful and generous, and yet there are those who seem to want to live by their own depraved values. And so, in order to protect the good Canadian citizens and refugees from this hatred and division, I'll be closing the beach indefinitely. And meanwhile, since I'm very resilient, I can still enjoy the remainder of today's sunshine. And although it's rare to have a clear and blue sky, all I had to do is make a couple of phone calls. Well, that was hilarious, Robin. <laughs> Thanks for putting that together. This certainly is the silly season with a bit of an edge. Uh, have to say, you know, have to say, I mean, look at look how much hair I have. Uh, our prime minister has, has had a haircut. <laughs> And uh hate to say that uh, so much of his personal appeal is his hair. Uh, I'm not that I'm in favor of that haircut, Prime Minister Trudeau. Un nonetheless, because we're in the silly season, I can make silly comments like that. Nonetheless, there's so many political messages flying back and forth. It, 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 despite being in the middle of summer, it's just non-stop, Robin. I noticed that the NDP MLAs, none of them, seem to be running against the premier dropping uh, like flies johnny they're dropping like flies <laughs> however one guy is yes. uh no doubt that housing minister david eby will be anointed for the job in september when they finally get around to a vote and you know he has enormous shoes to fill john i mean we have a, a premier right now in john horgan who has had enormous success he's been able to keep that party in the center politically, and it's made a big difference. And you really wonder whether EB can do the same. In the meantime, we also have the federal conservative race, and that has been very hot and very contentious. And they, they circle around the big issues and find ways to poke holes at the reigning liberals at the same time that they poke holes at each other. And one guy who's been particularly effective at this is Pierre Polyev. Here he is on the big lineups and the problems at the airport, particularly the fact they now have brought back the, uh, the testing, the COVID testing on a random basis. Here's what he has to say. They're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting just to drop off their bags. Then, God forbid, they might have an international flight. They'd have to go through customs where they'll wait and wait and wait. And of course, there's security as well. 
people have been talking about waiting four hours at this Toronto International Airport, Pearson, mostly because the Prime Minister continues to impose unjustified vaccine and other COVID-related restrictions that the world left behind long ago. Well, Pierre Polyev appears to be the man to beat to become the next leader of the Conservatives. The question remains, Robin, will Canadians who are not Conservatives support him? And you know, I thought that that would be a slam dunk answer as no. Okay, I thought so. But this man is an incredible storyteller. I watch some of his social media posts on issues. They're very effective. They're very um, appealing. Like despite the notion that the, 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 uh, the profile that this man is too far right for the average Canadian, he sure can tell a story very effectively. And if he does it better than anyone else, okay, it, you know, this is an open, open contest. One in five Canadians say they are not interested in getting booster vaccines, despite COVID being all around us again. This according to pollster Angus Reid. Yes, and there's a real fatigue out there. You can feel it, Johnny. Um, new polling also shows that Canadians are more likely to believe the BA5 variant is actually less serious than the previous strains of COVID-19. This polling was conducted by Angus Reid and shows that uh, a large majority of Canadians are vaccinated still, but it also shows a growing fatigue of many people right across the board. Mm -hmm. They're feeling that it's time to move away from masks, from vaccines, from mandates, or at least they're getting awfully tired of it. So here to talk more about the mood across the country and also about the pulse of our provincial government from Angus Reid is Shachi Curl. Let's zoom her in. And now joining us in the Victoria Rumble Room for the first time, Shachi Curl from Angus Reid. And Shachi, so great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Robin. Now, the biggest issue in British Columbia right now, besides all the rising expense and Omicron, is this terrible doctor shortage that we're experiencing. One in four British Columbians, nearly a million people. And uh, it's, it's, or it's one in five provincially, one in four in Southern Vancouver Island, just to be clear on that. But so many people don't have access to a family doctor. John Horgan is meeting with the premiers and uh, he says he expected the feds to come. Of course, the feds never said they were coming. He says that Ottawa's not paying its share. They're only paying 22%. They used to pay 50-50 back in the 60s. He wants to see that restored. So I guess my question is, what is the polling saying about the doctor shortage? Is this an issue that's serious enough that it could really threaten the future of this government? Wow, that's a hell of a windup. That's that's <laughs> a long windup to a question, Robin. What are what are uh, British Columbians saying about primary care and health care? First of all, as we know, it's just one of those issues along almost always with um, economic issues that are really at the top of the list, regardless of where you live in this country. And at times, no pun intended, those issues can become far more acute in certain parts of the country than others. And that is what we're seeing in British Columbia. This really is a summer of discontent on a, on a, a number of factors. You alluded to some of them, cost of living, inflation, uh, fears over housing, uh, worries about labor shortages. And in the midst of all of that, you can't get a doctor. So what we've watched over the last couple of years is British Columbians actually fairly satisfied with the way their governments were operating on, let's call it the general umbrella uh, on healthcare. And so much of that was driven by government response to COVID-19. So the pandemic has really, in some ways, um, perhaps uh, served to mask, not only in BC, but in a lot of other parts of the country, um, sort of the true state of primary care and health care in this country, and certainly um, the, the true state of things exacerbated by what we're seeing around doctor shortages and things like urgent care centers perhaps not living up to the billing that they've been hyped to. So, you know, you've got all of the premiers here this week. Um, getting together, speaking with a unified voice on the need for more health transfers. 
it is it is a really safe default thing for a politician to do to say uh, point the finger at Ottawa, band together with your provincial brothers and sisters, and say it's a big bad Ottawa's fault. But really, um, these these are also operational issues on the ground. And when we think about some of the 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 co-factors that can really drive um, a sense of dissatisfaction or a sense of frustration uh, among British Columbians. Think about it. We have we have a, um, a population that actually attracts an aging uh, population base. So where you see some of those shortages, particularly uh, on Vancouver Island, on the Sunshine Coast and more remote communities. Hey, you've got retirees. You've got people who are coming in migration to the province saying this is a really nice place to live but access becomes problematic. Um, you have an aging population. You've also got a complex population where people don't think of themselves as old. They think of themselves as healthy. But those hip replacements, those knee replacements, those surgical wait times, all of those also add upward pressure to the system at a time where more and more doctors are tapping out. And one of the other things we don't often talk about is sort of the, the issues of burnout and work-life balance when it comes to doctors, particularly young doctors, who are now at a point where perhaps the ethos or the philosophy has changed a little bit. You've just put yourself through school for years and years and years. Maybe you want to have kids. Maybe you don't want to work 100 hours a week anymore or 80 hours a week or, or really be um, the, uh, the constant on-call servant of your community in, in the way perhaps that we expected our medical practitioners to be 50, 70 years ago. So a lot's changed culturally. And, you know, what we're seeing is, is um, uh, the sort of the nexus or the intersection of a lot of issues coming to head all at once. I guess I'm just saying, though, that uh, we do have issues that stick. You think about the Campbell years. It was the HST, Glenn Clark. It was the fast ferries. Sometimes there's these issues that people just say, well, that's just not acceptable. That has to change. Do you not feel there's a vulnerability with this government? And that's why Horgan's pointing his figures so vigorously at Ottawa. I mean, there's always vulnerabilities with all governments. Um, you know, it's it is always the known unknown, if you will. So, will healthcare be what brings the province or this provincial government down? Will this be what what really starts a decline of of uh, uh, public opinion approval towards uh, this NDP government? Look, a couple of things. First of all, uh, you talked about the HST. You talked about a couple of other. That you talked about the fast ferries. Both of those came at the end of what had been extremely long tenures for for those governments. Uh, you you know the fast ferry sort of came at the end of what felt like many years of NDP government at that point. Uh, you had uh, the HST really sort of the last thing at the end of almost ten years of the Campbell government that that really brought it down uh, after three uh, two or three in 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 the case of the Campbell government three election cycles. So what does that tell us? It tells us there's still some life in this NDP government. Uh, we're not seeing in terms of polling uh, that things are starting to crumble as yet. But of course, vulnerability always exists. Why did we see the premier uh, take such a, a, a quick step to back down entirely on the museum? Because the Royal BC Museum project was becoming a huge symbol of uh, the discontent. It was becoming this lightning rod uh, uh, through which energy was feeding around dissatisfaction over health care and around dissatisfaction around other spending priorities and saying, why are we spending money on this when we should be spending it on other things? So, you know, this is a period of time, particularly through a transition of leadership where this government has to be quite careful but do I see in the data today that this is a government that is utterly vulnerable, where, where the, the trend uh, pointers are all going in the wrong direction? No, I don't see that yet. Mm. Sachi, so great to have you on the show. So honored. I mean, so uh, many of us locally remember you here uh, as a local beat reporter, now a national player. Uh, fantastic Good memories, I hope. <laughs> oh, yeah. A, oh, yeah. And, uh, and so, but I, I'd like so to build upon a sort of obvious um, sort of uh, 
a question from the last one, that being uh, COVID-19. I'm listening now how, how apparently this, this new variant is, is just sort of taking over. We're, gonna, we're, it, it, we're in another wave, wave number, I don't know, 18. Um, Seven, I think, but yeah, it may feel like 18 for <laughs> right? sure. And of course, then the domino becomes mandates and, and rules and, and things we're not allowed to do. And yet, what's the feel, what's the public's uh, uh, reaction to that? So what are they saying? Are we now seeing the Freedom Convoy actually representing public opinion? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, a couple of things to unpack there. First of all, we're actually we're we're in we're in field right now, um, trying to find out what Canadians and what British Columbians are thinking about all of this. Mm. I mean, I can only speak for myself and probably for a lot of you know people in my circle, which is there's a pervading sense of oh, not again, right? Mm. Not again, uh, and a frustration around that, and a sense of is this ever going to end? And people again. Uh, I think now have to come to terms with this, this sense of we did everything we were supposed to do. And I'm not talking about people who have resisted vaccines or been vax deniers or mask de deniers or just people sort of on the outside of the rules based or the, the guidance, the science guidance based population, which actually represented the vast majority of Canadians and British Columbians over the last two years. When your chief medical health officer in your province tells you, please do this, most people have said, okay, we'll do it and we'll do it gladly and we'll do it from a sense of community and we'll do it because we want to stay safe. Um, we now understand that, that these new variants based on what I've heard and read may be uh, you know, more transmissible and better able to evade things like vaccination and, and immunity. So uh, you've got that, you've got now, I think really the crux of all of this has been the messaging that we heard uh, when, when mask mandates were lifted, when crowd mandates were lifted. Okay, go back to normal. It's like, go back to normal. COVID's not over. Make your own decisions. Assess your, assess your own risk. Go back to normal. And so for me, I actually found that quite frustrating a few months ago. And everybody is, it's, it's personal for everyone. There are a lot of people who are just waiting to take off their masks and engage and go to big parties and do those things. For me, if you've got people in, in your circle who are immunocompromised, if you have loved ones or people you care about that you don't want to make sick, how do you resume that normal life without data? I'm a data geek. You know, how do you do that without being able to assess uh, what are the case counts out there? Where are the hot spots? What are the parts of the country that you maybe should be staying away from or should be going into? Has it stopped me from trying to resume some semblance of normalcy? Uh, no, but do I still wear a, an N95 mask at, at the grocery store in Penticton where everyone is giving me side eye and, and, and woo woo looks and I'm going, I don't care. I don't care, but everybody's different. Now we're into what feels like an impending next wave. And I really personally wonder if we're, we're perhaps not going to see a return to more robust and, and uh, regular frequent reporting based on the situation. Because you can't in one breath say, assess your own risk, figure it out for yourself, and then take away some of the tools that are needed to assess that risk. And so I would say I'm curious to see what other Canadians think about that. Well, the only other thing I'd add to it is that we hear it's much more transmissible, this new variant, but they're saying it's not as, as dangerous, at least they don't believe it is, or less likely to get you in the hospital. However, I, I don't disagree that we, we don't know enough yet to be able to make those determinations. And I think caution is still probably the best policy. It's something that I know most of us have tried to follow all along here. Uh, Shachi, we're getting close to the end of this, but I, I did want to ask you a question from the perspective of being a former Jack Webster Award winning journalist who's now a pollster and uh, see, where can you can you see it's transparent right like the award is transparent but it's there on my shelf oh that's fantastic <laughs> right on it's, you know the humility you know, that you've got it so close by it's good. but nobody can see it <laughs> nobody, yeah, right, the right. White wall. <laughs> nobody knows that's why we have to bring it up on this it's show very stealth it's very stealth you you do a lot of public work you're on you're on 
national national panels, you go on international panels, you are still writing columns, you're doing so much in a very public way. And yet so much information that people are getting today is on the internet. They're getting things from all these different sources on the internet. Recently, the beloved mayor of Victoria, she described social media commentary as a cesspool. So, and yet here we are on a social media outlet right now doing this show. Uh, from, from your perspective, do you think people are getting the right information today? Is that something that pollsters are, are mindful of when they're trying to get this information from people? Where are they getting their information? There's no doubt that we are an online engaged society. Uh, people are on Facebook in a huge way, Twitter less so, Instagram less so, TikTok less so. There you see more generational divides, but you know, based on the data that I've seen, the, the vast majority uh, of Canadians are on some social media platform. Now, it's really important to delineate online from social media, uh, obviously, because there are so many um, credible uh, news and information uh, portals online. And that is everything from, from news organizations, but well beyond that there, you know, you can, you can find really credible research papers. You can, you can learn anything online, though it is the world at your fingertips. At the same time though, you talk about the commentary and certainly I would say that, you know, even in the last couple of years, I'm far more inclined to put myself out there less than I used to be in terms of freewheeling commentary on a social media platform and really just more sticking to here's the news of the day uh, in yeah. terms of our data, using it as a way to share data, using it as a way to share some of the commentary I might have written in a column, uh, using it as a way to, a way to share credible information. But, uh, you know, Think back to 10 years ago when we thought this would be the marketplace of ideas and, and reason, debate and thought and conversation. It's just not really uh, something that a, a lot of folks I know really choose to play in anymore. Um, I, I will find that occasionally I will I will send a tweet um, ironically or, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek and the absolutist will take it absolutely and literally and amplify it. And it's like, no, that's not what I meant. Right. Or the conspiracy theorists will come out and, and start, you know, amplifying what they take from it. And I guess that is uh, an object of what happens in how ha used to happen in real life. I don't know. You guys, I, I say it a little bit tongue in cheek. You remember being at parties and maybe that's the way people talked. <laughs> <laughs> I just find that people hide behind now their, their, their little bot uh, uh, profiles and and it is it is a far more toxic place than it was even when we when we started the experiment of social media. So I don't know where that's going in terms of disinformation and misinformation. Absolutely. Um, I, what, what do you do? What do you do to counter it? What do you do to combat it? We were now living in an age where uh, Twitter is suing free speech absolutist Elon Musk to go through with the purchase. Mm -hmm. of the sale of the social media platform, even though according to, to polling data, there are a lot of social media users on that platform going, if, if that person buys that and enacts free speech, free speech absolution, we're out of here. We're going to go somewhere else. So I, I, I don't know. I feel like we're, we're, we're tumbling and gyrating and I don't really know where bottom is. Actually, I, I feel like I'm on TV right now. 30 seconds, okay? okay. Uh, last question. I go out there and I feel like everyone's so angry. I just feel like the rage is right here. You know, what's your data telling us? Are we just an angry country ready to explode? I, I actually think we're, we're not that at all. But I do think, and based on the data, I, I, see, I see common threads around kindness. I see common threads around shared values. But what I also see is a great deal of polarization. We are we are people who are way more pulled apart than we used to be. And, you know, we used to talk about sort of media through the, the lens of the Overton window, right? Like these are the limits of what we consider acceptable and, and OK in terms of thought and speech. I now say the Overton window is smashed and everyone's looking out their own window in their own room and seeing something entirely different and a different view. 
Shachi Curl, always a pleasure to talk to. And uh, I don't always agree with everything Shachi says, but she says it with such passion. She's so interesting, so quotable, and uh, we'll certainly look forward to having her back. And on a happy note, I have to say, it's time to say goodbye to all our family and all our friends and supporters and viewers on the Rumble Room for another week, John. But before we do that, perhaps you could again, in your usual erudite tone, explain how people can follow us and like us and become part of the party. Become part of the party, become part of the, the Rumble Room family. Uh, certainly, we are now inching towards 600,000 cumulative views. Robin, somebody's listening to us. You know, you and I aren't pressing like very all that much. <laughs> Those other people are involved. I just keep just... telling people I like myself, you know. But... <laughs> all right. <laughs> so the heart, obviously, of the show is our Facebook page. Uh, lots of activity now on Twitter. It gets those those clips get shared uh, extensively around the Twitterverse. Um, the, the, all of these shows are at our YouTube page. And of course, we allow access to folks to present their point of views at any time on our uh, Facebook news and views group site. Uh, we're also on Instagram. And for the more fringe opinions uh, that people like to uh, express, they get onto TikTok. And so during this summer, as I for maybe the only time I'd be allowed to wear a t-shirt, I remain John Jurisic, the mayor of North San, North Saanich. Hmm. I don't think Fred Haynes would be very happy about that. <laughs> the mayor of North Tulip, of course, alive and well in my pleasure dome, which also serves as my home. <laughs> and John, you know, it's really inspiring to know that you're wearing your summer black as opposed to your winter black. I think it's, it's a beautiful, a beautiful statement of being so incredibly style conscious. <laughs> I'm Robin Adair. Always a pleasure to join you every week on Victoria Rumble Room. And for now, all I can say is rumble on. <laughs> <laughs>